we're going to get started quickly here. We got a substantial lesson this morning. And in order that a platform was established for understanding Deuteronomy chapter 12 and the next scepter, several chapters of Deuteronomy as well, we spent some time last week examining a handful of basic God principles that are contained within chapter 12. And the first principle is this established covenant pattern. And the principle is that when the Lord offers a covenant to a nation or an individual, the acceptance of it is voluntary. One's not obligated to enter into that covenant that the Lord offers you. Certainly, the benefits that come from being part of that covenant will not be available to you if you reject his offer, but neither are you now subject to some special kind of curse or wrath that the rest of the world isn't, at least not in the short term, not while you're still alive. See, this covenant principle also has a flip side. It is that if you do accept God's covenant, then you've obligated yourself to all the terms and conditions set down in the covenant. We saw when we studied Jeremiah 31 that what we today call the new covenant It'd be better in our modern vocabulary to call it the renewed covenant. As, as a side note, the name that is emblematic of the Christian scripture, New Testament, those words were taken directly from Jeremiah 31. And, but we can readily see what happens when that translation is just a few degrees off the mark or disregards the culture and the setting and the plain meaning that it originally held because the wall of separation between Christians and Jews and the anti-Semitism that became characteristic of the church in general can be traced to this one sloppily translated word, new. If the translation had been more accurate, we would today have a Bible consisting of the same documents, but they would go under different titles, the Old and the Renewed Testament. I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about what an enormous difference that one seemingly small change would make. Imagine how that would completely alter the mindset of Gentile Christians towards Jews, towards Israel, towards redemption the nature of our Messiah, our attitude towards the Bible in general. So we shouldn't be so shocked that when, say, our online Torah class members and other groups of believers like this congregation who have recognized this fundamental doctrinal error that arose from a simple mistranslation, try to explain it to the church at large, it usually reaches deaf ears and closed minds. Why is that? If the institutional church were to accept and correct this error, to recognize the self-evident reality that the church cannot possibly be a replacement Israel, if the original Israel, as prophesied, has returned lock, stock, and barrel, it would fundamentally change the nature of the church. It would force many pastors, many denominational leaders to admit that much of the basis of their doctrinal theology and traditions isn't accurate. It needs to be amended a little bit. Jeremiah makes it clear that the fundamental difference between the original Mosaic covenant and its future renewal, made possible through Messiah, the difference is the covenant's mediator. Further, that the Lord himself would put the Torah, its laws and regulations into one's heart, meaning minds, thoughts. Whereas before it was commanded upon the individual in the original giving of the covenant, that each person should put it into their own heart, their own mind, by means of self-discipline and an intent towards scrupulously following these divine regulations. So for the modern believer, here's the rub. 
What's the difference between the covenant of Moses found in the Torah and what we typically call the new covenant in Christ? Very little. Which is why Yeshua said so loud and clear in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, that the law and the prophets hadn't passed away, and they would not until heaven and earth passed away. The essential difference lay only in who the mediator of that covenant is. Moses, then later Yeshua, Jesus, and how does one agree to be part of the covenant? The way to accept the covenant in Moses' day was to become physically part of the nation of Israel. And for males, that meant submitting to a berit milah, a circumcision ceremony. For females, they either had to be born into Israel, or they had to declare their allegiance to Israel, or to marry a Hebrew male. Today, the way to join God's redeeming covenant with Israel is by means of faith in the works and in the person of Jesus Christ. And the nature of that covenant and being a party to it, although it's grounded in terms of the Mosaic Covenant, is spiritual. But the spiritual covenant, of course, continues the terms and conditions precisely manifests um, in the same way in the covenant of Moses. How those terms and conditions come about themselves may be a little bit different because they become culturally neutral and they're taken to a higher spiritual level in Messiah. But every last God-ordained principle of Torah remains the same. In fact, St. Paul spends a lot of time speaking of the do's and the don'ts of the covenant in his letters in culturally neutral terms. The point is, that the requirement of the new or better renewed covenant is not only to demonstrate love, as seems to be the sum total of the requirements for a believer in the modern church doctrines today, but also that we're required to obey. We're required to observe all the underlying principles of the Mosaic Covenant. We have obligations to God as a result of our accepting Christ. The trick, of course, is how do we apply those principles in a modern culture, in modern times? How the lack of a physical temple, temple a physical priesthood in Jerusalem affects matters. How do we take into account that Yeshua has atoned for our sins as the once and for all sacrifice. Now another principle established in the book of Deuteronomy is that God is knowable. Now we've discussed this principle in depth because most of us have grown up in a Western Judeo-Christian culture where the idea that God is knowable isn't very surprising to us, but in Moses' day such a thought was laughable. It flew in the face of everything universally understood about the world of gods. God has revealed himself to us. He has given us his laws and his regulations, which explains his justice system and his character. He's made it clear he cares about us. He's available to those who love him and that he does not change. He doesn't evolve. He's not a distant God. He's not inherently ambiguous. He's present. He's precise. Therefore, by definition, he's entirely different than the false pagan gods of the Babylon mystery religions that the rest of the world, other than Israel, worshipped. Those God principles led us to the next one. Since God is entirely different from all the gods of the myriad of the Babylon mystery religions, then he's not to be worshipped in the same manner they're worshipped. Israel's not merely to convert 
a pagan altar or a shrine by rededicating it to Jehovah, God of Israel. That was kind of the common practice. Israel is not to mix the pure Torah instructions with familiar but impure pagan traditions in their worship of God Almighty. Rather, they're to destroy what pa whatever pagan altars and places of worship that existed within the land, within the land of Canaan, that God's given to them. And finally, we ended with a God principle that while so essential to understanding mankind's current condition, condition and our future destiny, is really misunderstood. It is that the terms and the conditions of the covenants that God has offered to men are heavenly ideals. The terms and conditions are stated as expressions of perfection. Notwithstanding their ideal nature, physically speaking, every law and commandment can and should be followed and obeyed. There is nothing inherently impossible or too difficult for humans about eating certain foods and not eating other foods. With making a pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem when it existed, from refra with refraining from telling a lie, or committing adultery, or killing a man unjustly, or observing a seventh day Sabbath. We are all capable of giving offerings, even if it might give us a bit less to live on. Celebrating the biblical feasts, so on. The problem has never been that man wasn't created as able to fully obey God. It's been that our sinful natures and our evil inclinations, along with the resultant nature of the corroded cultures that we live in today, make the full performance of all of these ideals a practical impossibility. In fact, the ideal result that God has in mind can no longer even happen without Messiah coming to make it happen. So fallen, so spiritually deformed is mankind. That, of course, does not mean that as the Savior's disciples, we abandon trying to live up to those written ideals. We are to strive for them at all times. In, new to, in the New Testament, or the Renewed Testament, Paul refers to the attempt to do so as perfecting the saints, or running the good race. Let's uh, reread Deuteronomy chapter 12. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 221. I read, I'm sorry, 211, 211. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and to obey in the land that Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on earth. You must destroy all the places where the nations you are dispossessing served their gods, whether on high mountains or on hills or under some leafy tree break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, cut down the carved images of their gods, exterminate their name from that place. But you're not to treat Adonai your God this way. Rather, you are to come to the place where Adonai your God will put his name. He will choose it from all your tribes. You will seek out that place, which is where he will live and go there. You will bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tenths that you set aside for Adonai. The offerings that you give, the offerings you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. There you will eat in the presence of Adonai your God and you will rejoice over everything you set out to do, you and your households in which Adonai your God has blessed you. You will not do the things the way we do them here today where everyone does whatever uh, is, is in his own opinion seems right because you haven't yet arrived at the rest and inheritance which Adonai your God's giving you. But when you cross the Jordan and you live in the land Adonai your God is having you inherit and he gives you rest from all of your surrounding enemies so that you're living in safety, then you will bring all that I'm ordering you to the place Adonai your God chooses to have his name live. Your burnt offerings, sacrifices, tents, 
the offering from your hand, all your best possessions that you dedicate to Adonai, and you will rejoice in the presence of Adonai, your God, you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levites staying with you, inasmuch as he has no share or inheritance with you. Be careful not to offer your bird offerings just anywhere you see, but do it in the place that Adonai will choose in one of your tribal territories. There is where you are to offer your bird offerings. Do everything I order you to do. However, you may slaughter and eat meat wherever you live, whenever you want, in keeping with the degree to which Adonai, your God, has blessed you. The unclean and the clean may eat it as if it were gazelle or deer. Don't eat the blood. Pour it out on the ground like water. You are not to eat on your own property the tenth of your grain, new wine or olive oil that you set aside for Adonai, or the firstborn of your cattle or sheep, or any offering you have vowed, or your voluntary offering, or the offering from your hand. No, you are to eat these in the presence of Adonai your God in the place Adonai your God will choose. You, your sons, daughters, male and female slaves, and the Levite who is your guest. And you are to rejoice before Adonai your God in everything you undertake to do. As long as you are living on your property, take care not to abandon the Levite. When Adonai your God expands your territory as he promised you, and you say, I want to eat meat, simply because you want to eat meat, then you may eat meat as much as you want. If the place which Adonai your God chooses to place his name is too far away from you, then you are to slaughter animals from your cattle or sheep, which Adonai your God has given you, and you're to eat on your own property as much as you want. Eat it as you would, gazelle or deer. The unclean and clean alike may eat it. Just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you're not to eat the life with the meat. Don't eat it. Pour it out on the ground like water. But do not eat it so that things will go well with you and with your children after you as you do what Adonai sees is right. Only the things set aside for God, which you have, and the vows you have vowed to make, you must take and go to the place which Adonai will choose. There you will offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood, on the altar of Adonai your God. The blood of your sacrifices is to be poured out on the altar of Adonai your God, and you will eat the meat. Obey. Pay attention to everything I'm ordering you to do so that things will go well with you and with your descendants after you forever as you do what Adonai sees as good and right. When Adonai your God has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to dispossess, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in their land, be careful. After they have been destroyed ahead of you, not to be trapped into following them so that you inquire after their gods and ask, how did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. You must not do this to Adonai your God, for they have done to their gods all the abominations that Adonai hates. They've even burned up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Big changes are afoot. Israel is about to abandon the way of the Bedouin desert wanderer that they have experienced for the past 40 years, and they're now going to assume the life of a settled society based around agriculture and herding in the land of Canaan. Therefore, these changing societal conditions mean that the ways that they can carry out God's principles have to change. Dwayne L. Christensen, the author of the word Biblical commentary on Deuteronomy says this about the Israelites changing circumstances and how it relates to ours. He says this, a true theologically conservative position, one that preserves the values of our heritage, is a position that stands between the extremes, but it preserves the tension between them. It is not enough to maintain that religion itself has changed constantly since the time of the wilderness experience of ancient Israel. Older practices may be outdated, but the values that produce those practices in times past remain valid in the present. The pressing task 
is to find new forms that preserve those timeless values. Moses is about to order new forms that preserve those same timeless values that God gave to Israel on Mount Sinai. And the first order of business has to do with just where God's sanctuary is going to be located and whether or not it is to remain as the sole place where sacrificing can occur. And it is this place where we're told that Yehovah, God's name, will dwell. Now, this is an important concept to understand because wherever his name dwells, it's there that he's accessible. It's also important because this drives home the point that God himself, meaning the sum of all that he is, will not be dwelling in the tabernacle. He never has. He never will. The sum of all who God is dwells in heaven, not on earth, and he certainly doesn't restrict himself to some building made by humans. This idea of his name dwelling there deserves some discussion. For us modern Western culture folks, the meaning of a person's name is simply a means to identify that person from millions of others. It's not much different than a street address or a social security number. But in Eastern culture, particularly in Bible times, a name has a, had a much broader, a much more significant sense to it. In Hebrew, the word we translate as name is Shem, and it means reputation. It denotes a set of attributes, a set of characteristics of a person. So when the Lord's name is established in a place, it means that his essence and his nature is attached, in that some or all of his unique attributes are, are present or represented there. Now, while the idea of establishing his name somewhere is kind of a mysterious thing, no matter how we try to explain it or define it, one way to think of it is in the same vein as his Holy Spirit living within us. Is the Holy Spirit, or in Hebrew, the Ruach HaKodesh, actually the totality of everything the Lord is? Well, apparently it's not or we who have the Spirit within us, would certainly not be instructed in the Bible to pray to our Father who lives in heaven. Rather, there is some essence or attribute of Him that dwells within these fleshly tents. So I think it's fair to say that in Moses' era, just as the Lord will establish His name at a location of His choosing, somewhere in the land of Canaan, for all Israel to sacrifice, he has also established his name within every believer. And that the Holy Spirit dwelling in the human disciple of Christ is roughly equivalent in days of old to God dwelling with his Israelite worshipers by appearing above the mercy seat in the wilderness tabernacle later on the temple. And verse 6 says that it is at the one location where Jehovah God has established his name that all the tribes of Israel are to go. It's there that they're to worship and sacrifice. For us, the words worship and sacrifice seem of themselves exacting enough to define their meaning because somewhere along the way, we've determined that we have almost unlimited choice in determining what worship and what sacrifice amounts to. The problem is that while we do have some freedom in that regard, we also have boundaries. And the one general boundary that this chapter puts forth first and foremost is that we must not employ ways, means, and forms that the pagans commonly use to worship their gods, false gods. Several years ago, I gave a rather extensive teaching on the word praise, praise, 
And what we find is that there's more than a dozen different words in Hebrew used in the Bible to describe various acts and aspects of honoring the Lord. All of which are typically reduced and translated into one single English term, praise. So we run around saying to one another, well, just what is a good and acceptable way to praise God? Can we raise our hands? Or must we stand with our arms at our sides, motionless? Can we shout with joy? Can we dance? Or do we have to be somber and quiet? Ironically, each one of the dozen or so Hebrew words that Bible scholars rather flip flippantly run, uh, lump together and translate them all to praise is in the original a description of a precise form of acceptable praise. So the Bible actually gives us several different forms of how to praise God. Each one is fairly specific in nature and appropriate under various circumstances. I'm not going to get into all of them today. I'm simply illustrating a point. And the point is that in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 12, we get a list of things that are almost always bundled together using the general terms of sacrifices and offerings. But each one of these things has a precise and different meaning. And so the scriptures give us a pretty detailed range of just what is to be transported to the central sanctuary, presented to God, and under what circumstance? Uh, let, let's look at that list. Now understand there is disagreement as to the meaning of each of these words as they have no direct word or word, word translation into any other language from Hebrew. So every attempt at translation is essentially an educated guess at what the purpose of each particular sacrifice was. First is the burnt offering. In Hebrew, it's called olah. And olah is usually thought to mean near offering or that which goes up. And it refers, at least partially, to the smoke that's emitted from a burning sacrifice. It's referring to the animals that are killed and placed on the altar to be burned up. With this type of sacrificial offering, none of the animal is to be left for either the worshiper or the attending priest to consume for himself or herself. Second is what is often rather sloppily translated as other sacrifices. The actual Hebrew word here is zeva, which is a specialized kind of sacrifice that belongs in what's called the shalamim category. Sometimes this is called in our Bibles a peace offering. And whatever the exact nature and purpose of the zeva, with this kind of sacrifice, only some of it gets burned up on the altar. The remainder is shared between the worshipers and the priests as food. The third kind mentioned in this passage is the tithe or literally the tenth. And the primary function of the tithe was as a means of support for the tabernacle later on the temple. Included in that support was the support of the Levite workers who performed all the various needed functions around the tabernacle. And most of that support was in the form of farm produce and animals. Again, not as sacrifices per se, but simply as a means of direct support for all these tabernacle workers. And over time, as the Hebrew culture evolved, a smaller part of society was agriculturally based with this growing def demographic of, of traders and merchants and craftsmen and so on, then money was given in lieu of animals or produce. Now, fourth is a type called a terumah, and that just means contributions. The Hebrew indicates giving something that is taken from a larger amount. It refers to the first fruits offerings and usually is presented as that kind of offering with the strange name of heave offering. 
It's an offering that is presented by lifting this offering literally above your shoulders and waving it around. And if you're thinking, my gosh, there's lots of different kinds of giving that are expected, you're right. The tithe was just one form of giving that was expected. Con the contribution, equivalent to the fir first fruits offering, that was another kind. And people were expected to give both, not just one. Next were what we call the votive and the free will offerings in Hebrew neder. These were sacrifices and gifts that were the result of vows made to God. It was that if God would do something for that person who was making the vow or maybe prevent something bad from happening, then this person would give some agreed to amount or thing to God in return. Now understand that this neder was not the promised gift to God. It was what accompanied the vow ritual. On the other hand, there was a kind of neder in which a worshiper simply gave something as an expression of gratitude, expression of thanksgiving, where nothing was vowed or promised. It was just a spontaneous giving. Finally, we have the designation of firstlings or bechora. In Hebrew another way of saying this is firstborn and the idea is to give of the firstborn of your flocks and herds to the Lord so while first fruits terumah involves produce firstlings bechorah involves living creatures now you can see as a result there's quite a range of offerings and sacrifices for several different purposes so to lump them all together really misses the point and it fails to teach us very much about what's expected of us regarding giving and sacrificing. We saw the same thing back in Leviticus when we when uh, attached to a range of differing atoning sacrifices, there were specific kinds of sin. And each was designed to atone for something specific. It starts to make apparent this very complex, this multifaceted nature of sin and then atonement that's otherwise obscured in more typical church doctrine. And that's usually expressed that a sin is a sin is a sin no matter what the sin is. Well, verse 7 makes it clear that the entire household is to be involved with the giving of these various sacrifices offer and offerings when it includes feasting that goes with it. Now one has to read between the lines a little bit to get the overall understanding of what's happening here. This is referring to the three annual pilgrimage festivals whereby each family must come to the tabernacle, again later on the temple, to celebrate, to bring their sacrifices. And Deuteronomy makes it clear that indeed the whole family is to come. These are feasts of joy. They're God's appointed times, so the family is to join in. Let me remind you that between Exodus and Leviticus, seven biblical feasts were established. Of them, three are called Chag, or pilgrimage festivals, meaning that the family makes a pilgrimage to a, to a central sanctuary. Most of the time that indicated Jerusalem. By definition, the other four feasts are not pilgrimage festivals, so the family is to celebrate those locally, wherever they live. Although, if they chose to go to the tabernacle or temple, they certainly could. Let me also make note that in very short order, one certain non-pilgrimage biblical feast became combined with one of the required pilgrimage feasts, so that in effect, Four biblical feasts were celebrated at the temple, three of them at home. Passover, Pesach, is not a pilgrimage feast. But the feast that starts the day after Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Matzah, is. Because those two feasts were held on consecutive days, because just like church folks today, we prefer to have celebrations held at a church building on certain occasions, like Christmas and New Year or whatever, it was logical 
that the Israelite families would prefer to have Passover as the awesome temple complex in Jerusalem, at the awesome temple complex in Jerusalem. Therefore, they just go ahead and celebrate, celebrate Passover in Jerusalem by arriving a day early. Well, beginning in verse 8, the rules about restricting sacrifice to only one place are fleshed out a little bit further. And in doing so, we're introduced to yet another fundamental God principle. It is that Jehovah God, not men, authorizes the way the Lord's to be worshipped. And that the proper worship of God consists of his ordained ceremonies that are to proceed in his ordained ways at his appointed times. This is another of those principles that most believers will respond to with a disinterested yawn and say, well, of course I worship how God wants me to, but come on, this is the 21st century. I have complete freedom to worship when I want, where I want, how I want. I don't have any rules. I can do it any way I want to. Folks, that's just not true. It's not true. While we certainly are not obligated to worship at a wilderness tabernacle, nor must we, we recite precise words, nor have one particular order of service, nor are we restricted to praying only at certain times and places, the Lord has given us dates and times and ways that he says we're to worship him. Rather, it's just that religion, such as the Canaanites were practicing, religion that the Lord, here in Deuteronomy says, has to be destroyed. Do it his way, not the way we want to do it. One of the most eminent conservative, fundamental, biblical scholars of our day is Dr. Walter Kaiser, Jr., who is the academic dean at famed Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. At least he was until he retired. And his works have probably affected modern church doctrines and theologies of the evangelical movement about as much as anybody currently living. I want you to listen to the rather surprising things he has to say about the Old Testament and its rules and its regulations as it pertains to our modern Christian worship practices and our worship doctrines. Listen to what he says. In order to make up for the hiatus of instruction on all sorts of practical questions about how to deal with everyday problems such as youth conflicts and the like, evangelicals flock by the thousands in every major metropolitan area to special seminars as an open testimony to their hunger for true biblical instruction on matters that were actually dealt with in the Old Testament law. To be sure, most of these seminars on youth problems and marriage enrichment and business management techniques drew heavily on the biblical wisdom books of the Old Testament, especially Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. But what few have realized and what still remains is one of the best kept secrets to this very day is that these same wisdom books have as their fountainhead the law of Moses. One need take only one need only take a marginally competent reference bible and notice how frequently the text of proverbs for example directly quotes or alludes to the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in its popularized bumper sticker way of theologizing. Just these few examples ought to be enough to warn a contemporary pastor and Bible teacher. We must overcome our inherited prejudice against the Old Testament, especially as concerns the law. We must immediately move to balance the spiritual diet of God's people. Few people today would espouse a junk food nutritional plan as a regular plan of good eating. But how many Christians prefer to eat only the dessert that's found in the New Testament? In order to address this imbalance, 
we must begin to use the Old Testament in a more balanced and holistic teaching ministry. I like that statement. Because I hope that's what we do around here. And I realize that Seed of Abraham members and Torah class listeners have been drinking as if from a fire hose now for several years as we've worked our way carefully through the Torah of God, taking a year usually to get through one book. But what we must not do is think that just because these books contain a lot of detail and, and a history, that what we have here is merely a collection of interesting historical facts that pertains only to an ancient people. And that is because it has everything to do with us, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And in no way are believers free from obedience to the God principles presented to us, nor from observance of God's appointed times as stated in the law of Moses. Certainly these aren't what brings us redemption, nor were they ever at any time in history. But these are and they remain the principles for worship, for right living, well, as redeemed people anyway, that we're fully expected to follow. Since the body of Christ has determined for some time now to abandon the laws and rules of God in favor of unfettered individual liberty instead of following our own hearts, we lament and we complain that the church seems to have lost its way. It doesn't seem to have any spiritual power anymore. Is it any wonder? I mean, as both the Old Testament and the New explain, obedience to God and the experience of his power are tied together as a quid pro quo. Therefore, as does Walter Kaiser, I ask you to re-examine your worship practices, how you celebrate, how you follow the Lord, to see if perhaps they're not in harmony with God's ordinances. Because if they're not, the next question is, who is it then in reality that I'm trying to follow? Who is it I'm trying to please? The Lord addresses that exact question in verse number 8. He says that you are not to act as you act now, which is every man as he pleases. Let me rephrase that. You've been pleasing yourselves. You've been following the political correctness of the world. You've been follow, adhering to philosophical doctrines of religion. But you're doing it in my name and I don't like it. And you know what else? I don't accept it. When has this doing as every man sees and as right in his own eyes been occurring? all during the wilderness journey, the whole time of it. But as verse 9 says, now that you're about to enter the land of promise, stop doing this. Instead, in verse 10, when they cross the Jordan to enter the place of rest and security that God's offered, obey these commandments that were given to you on Mount Sinai. And in doing so, you will rejoice in your inheritance. You, along with your family, your slaves, even the Levites, before the presence of the Lord. So let me summarize this short section of Deuteronomy about what's being ordered here concerning worship and sacrifice. There is God's acceptable way on the one end of the spectrum. Then there's man's accept, unacceptable way that exides at, uh, resides at the other end. There's no middle ground. There's no compromise. There's no happy medium. The Hebrew people cannot serve themselves and serve the God of Israel. They can't serve both God and the gods of the Canaanites, not even if it's primarily serving God and just secondarily serving, serving Baal. See, this exact sentiment is put another way 1,300 years into the future by Yeshua, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 6.24, he says, 
No man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 15 introduces a necessary, practical, and rather radical shift for the Israelites as they begin to set up life in the promised land. It is that they are now permitted to eat meat without it first being given as part of a sacrifice. Let me remind you that up to this point, this is since the law was given on Mount Sinai around 40 years earlier, the ordinance was that all meat from domestic animals that the Hebrews hoped to eat would first have to be part of a sacrificial ritual accomplished by the priesthood at the wilderness tabernacle. I emphasize domestic animals because you see it was permitted for Israel to eat meat from undomesticated animals such as deer provided it was on the kosher list. That is this undomesticated species chewed the cud, had a cloven hoof, and among a couple of other requirements. Anyway, for all practical purposes, the animals that formed the typical flocks and herds that came along with Israel on their exodus from Egypt were classified as domestic animals, and therefore clean animals, meaning that they were considered ritually pure, therefore acceptable for altar sacrifice to God. But even kosher wild animals were not permitted to be used as sacrifices to the Lord. So the rule was, as concerns to domestic animals, whatever was suitable for sacrifice was acceptable for food to God's people. And the people could only eat the meat of their domestic animals that had first been offered as a sacrifice. Because of where they lived, mainly the western end of the Arabian Peninsula and the Sinai Desert regions, there was precious little wild game. Venison, although it was acceptable, would have been a pretty rare treat. And most of those families likely never had the privilege of even tasting it. Birds would have probably been more available because even though the quail episode we read about that was a miraculous event, it was a miraculous event, it was usual for enormous flocks of quail to fly over the Sinai and settle on the ground occasionally for a brief rest during their migration. None of these were required to be a sacred offering before they could be eaten. The new rule, though, is that a line is being drawn between the eating of meat to satisfy hunger and the offering of meat for sacred purposes. Because God operates as he does, and most everything he ordains is not for his benefit, but it's for mankind's. Even at times we don't really see it or understand that benefit. One of the practical benefits of the Lord ordaining only eating of animals from their herds and flocks during the wilderness journey, only upon their being offered a sacrifice, is that it prevented the herds and flocks from being decimated. It was a lot of trouble, as you can imagine, to take an animal to the tabernacle to be ritually slaughtered, and generally the worshiper only received a portion of it back for food. I mean, can you imagine the long lines of people wanting to make sacrifices, sacrifices at the tabernacle, but the relatively limited facilities that were able to accommodate them? Therefore, meat, though just as desirable to them as it is to us, meat wasn't eaten all that often. And since meat spoiled, just in a matter of hours, whatever was slaughtered had to be cooked, then eaten completely, almost immediately. There was no doling it out over a period of days. Yes, they had learned to dry meat to preserve it, and it did occur but they had to be someplace where that process could be set up and even the animals available for that were relatively few. What we understand by the beginning verse of this section of Deuteronomy 12 is that obviously people had not been obeying this rule. They did what we intend to do. 
we obey some of what God says and ignore the rest for our convenience. The people positively crave meat. And when we crave anything, our natures take over. And we'll do things we probably ought not to do to obtain what we crave. But now that Israel is about to enter into a settled life with lots of grazing land and an ability to grow their herds and flocks to a much greater number, the risk of decimating their flocks that were necessarily limited in size due to the very limited grazing and water they were going to experience during their wilderness journey, this was ending. Obviously, God had already approved eating meat, even if it was a big inconvenience to do so. So now the Lord is telling Israel to help themselves to as much as they want. But there will be some boundaries to this new freedom, and we're going to talk about those boundaries next time. Please rise. <laughs>